This is Boyer's Modern History of Muskoka with your host, Patrick Boyer. Welcome to another episode of Muskoka's Modern History. I'm Patrick Boyer. Back in the summer of 1874, a number of Americans gathered in upstate New York beside a lake bearing the lyrical Seneca name Chautauqua. At first, being Protestants, they followed the well-known model of Methodist and Baptist summer camp meetings. But onto that wholesome, egalitarian, revivalist pattern, they grafted a lyceum program of education. The kind of lectures, discussions, concerts, and entertainments offered by a private entity, not the public schooling system. Chautauqua infused authentic cultural experience into the lives of people in small towns and rural settings. These inspirational summer meetings in resort-like settings included onstage entertainments, adult education through lectures by prominent authorities on both timeless topics and contentious issues of the day, and a highly rigorous book circle reading program, which, in several jurisdictions, even earned college credits. Chautauqua uniquely filled a continent-wide cultural vacuum because its popular program did not play down to the public, but sought to uplift people. Especially appealing was the extension of its programs for cultural enrichment through circuit Chautauquas. These road tours took entertainment and education to people starving for culture, but who, being tied to toil in fields and factories, could not attend remote Chautauqua assemblies in Lakeland countryside. These mobile Chautauquas rotated performers daily through the many communities on their booking circuit. It was a tightly run operation, relying on an interlocking maze of train schedules, automobiles, and good weather to keep rural roads from becoming mud traps. A city or town for one charmed week was home to a huge Chautauqua tent. The brown canvas of this arena-like space was Chautauqua's trademark. Chautauqua's portable canvas playhouse was the stage for a rotating roster of musicians, lecturers, and dramatists, each in turn entertaining and educating local citizens throughout an intensive week-long program. In 1916, during the First World War, Charles Sinclair Applegath, a vibrant young Methodist minister of liberal views and questing mind, organized an Epworth Summer School at Windermere House on Lake Russell. And feeling confined by the narrowness of the Churchy Upworth League, he shifted his Muskoka gatherings from Methodist Church jurisdiction to Chautauqua's interdenominational umbrella. He would now welcome even those with no religious affiliation at all. So in 1921, when Charles Applegat and his bride Edna Lytle of Port Hope honeymooned at Waskata Inn on Tobin's Island. The property spread over 218 magnificent acres and ran along more than two miles of spectacular shoreline. Atop its rocky summit, Waskata Inn's hexagon towers gave the apple gas one of Canada's finest views. Discovering the place was for sale, Applegath swiftly incorporated the Canadian Chautauqua Institution Limited, became its president and manager, issued a prospectus to solicit $40,000, that's a million dollars in today's purchasing power, raised that amount, bought the Wascata, carried out repairs and renovations, renamed it Epworth Inn in a nod to the assembly's origins, and opened the refurbished place just as the fresh paint dried for his summer 1921 Muskoka Assembly of the Canadian Chautauqua Institution. The exhilarating spirit 
engendered by the Muskoka assemblies was a lively flame with good fuel and a fanning breeze. In this context, Muskoka Chautauqua's was programmed to promote Canadian books and Canadian reading became the vanguard for an historic cultural shift. Among the assembly's focused efforts were its Canadian Chautauqua Reading Circle. They created a new sense of national identity by blending an open spiritual quest with resolute emphasis on Canadian literature. Muskoka Chautauqua had a serious agenda for national renewal. Its overriding emphasis was Canadian literature and Canadian studies. Lectures and readings during the summer on Tobin's Island greatly enhanced appreciation for the assigned books. The Tobin's Island Assembly featured famous authors of the day. They read from their works, were accessible to their audiences, and keenly discussed current issues. In its liberating way, the Skoka Chautauqua would do for Canadian literature what the Group of Seven was doing for Canadian art. For those on Tobin's Island, waves slapping at the shore, white stars twinkling in a blue-black sky above. These free-thinking professors and poets, journalists and musicians, scientists and public figures who stayed for weeks on end, lodged either in Epworth Inn or their own cottages and tents on the surrounding land. Over the years, more than 800 participants were attracted by the Tobin's Island program. Canada's wartime flying ace, Billy Bishop, who in July 1920 had inaugurated Canada's first scheduled air service with flights between Toronto's waterfront and Muskoka Lakes, landed a seaplane on Lake Rossell to join the Chautauqua sessions at Upward Inn. Mohawk Chief War Eagle from the Cognawaga community near Montreal regularly taught basics of Indigenous culture especially the meaning of rituals and beliefs about nature. Father of Canadian poetry, Sir Charles G. D. Roberts, was a regular at the Muskoka Sessions. Roberts also delivered speeches across Canada, praising Muskoka Chautauqua for, quote, doing much toward the development of Canadian literature and culture. Margot Gordon wrote plays and directed The Little Theatre in the Woods, where, weather permitting, Open-air dramas, concerts, and lectures were performed. Created by Hart House Theater members at University of Toronto, the Little Theater was staged for new Canadian plays mounted by university student actors who learned their lines between waiting tables at Upworth Inn. Author Sylvia Duvernet concluded that the Tobin's Island program, quote, produced the most exciting and worthy Chautauqua group in Canada, close quote. Chautauqua in Muskoka indeed became a major national story, as of summer-long assemblies during the 1920s and early 1930s morphed into fame as Canada's literary Chautauqua. This literary initiative on Tobin's Island did, for Canadian identity and Canadian literature, as I noted, what the group of seven artists were achieving for painting, understanding our own country by seeing it through our own Canadian eyes for the first time. Thank you for joining me for this episode of Modern History of Muskoka here on Hunters Bay Radio. Broadcasting from Huntsville, our producer is Jacob Krieger. I'm Patrick Boyer. <laughs>